<coughs> you would think with a studying a subject like grace that it would be hard to confuse it, abuse it, or use it in some of, in some way that wasn't designed or meant to be. And yet somehow people seem to really mess grace up because I think the problem lies mostly when they're studying grace or when they hear about this term grace, they think, well, okay, so I've been given a gift that I can't repay, you know, and I've been given this thing freely without me really doing much except, you know, maybe accepting Jesus, but since it's grace, then I can do whatever I want to do. You know, and they treat the object of grace as though an accomplished fact as opposed to the person who's giving the grace, which is God. And I think maybe that's where most of the issues lie. In defining grace, they take God out of the picture rather than put him back into the picture because dealing with God is a holy subject. <laughs> Grace for me has always been pretty simple. I thought of a king. I watched all the little, you know, like Robin Hood, you know, the little TV shows and you know, the king of England's or, you know, some knight of the round tables or, you know, King Arthur or all these other things, you know, and I I always kind of got the idea that if you were in the king's court and you weren't supposed to be, off with his head, you know, kind of like the Queen Esther and King Ahasuerus, you know, how his wife one day was called for and she wouldn't show up and so he banished her. One time she showed up in court and he didn't appreciate it. He could have took her head off. And when Ruth, when, Ruth, when um, <coughs> Esther presented herself before the king, she had already warned Mordecai that, hey, you know what, if I go before the king and I'm not asked to show myself to him, then, unless he extends grace to me, I will be killed according to the law. And so, the way that the king extended grace was to extend his scepter, his power of authority, his authority to her. He would give a part of himself to her so that he could spend and change the focus of his attention onto her as she has presented herself into the court. And so, if he did that, she could advance onward into the court closer to the king and get his ear and then pay attention and spend time with him and talk to him. But if he didn't extend his scepter to her or pay attention to her in some way, acknowledge her existence and the fact that she's there in court and she wasn't asked for it. And those servants around the king, you know, the king's court, the guards, they'd kill her. Wouldn't No questions asked. Drag her out of court and not even pay attention. She'd never even have a chance to be known that she was there. So because I understood that about protocol, when it came to kingly things, I guess I didn't have a problem with grace. Because I always figured, ooh, God better extend his mercy towards me. Otherwise, grace will not be given to me except that he decides to bestow it upon me because of what Jesus has done. So I always kind of knew that Grace was not an object already given, but grace was an active decision by God to do something to me and for me and with me. 
because you see, as long as he's still alive and he lives forever, and as long as I need mercy and grace, which will probably be forever, then I think there needs to be a ongoing relationship of grace and mercy between him and I. Otherwise, I have to abide under what? Fear or terror or, you know, trying to work my way into the king's court to be accepted in his sight. Jesus said there was a better way that love because he had taken care of the penalty of sin and the consequence of our transgressions that by his atoning sacrifice love would be our motivation to present ourselves to the Father that God wanted us as sitting up there far removed from us because of our sin wanted us to come closer to come up hither and to spend time to find mercy and grace because the closer we came to God the more we discovered that God never intended to kill us in fact he wanted us to sit down and eat with him you know Jesus said Did any man hear my voice open the door I will come into him and sup with him that another place he says I and my father will come and we will eat with them I like that eating that is it makes me stop and think about and chew upon what it is that grace is because then I start going man without grace imagine trying to get to God without grace imagine trying to understand God without love imagine trying to <clears throat> present yourself to God that I can't imagine so because there's been such a confusion about grace you know we've been studying you know why grace changes everything with Chuck Smith about <coughs> one of my famous quotes is grace is the action of love the bestowing of grace or the imputing of righteousness to us through grace is that which God does because he is love and so I have kind of my own way of looking at grace and my own way of defining it and you know resigning to it and applying it as grace for grace and mercy for mercy and forgiveness for forgiveness because there is an equal scale with God and while we don't like to talk about the other side of grace there is an other side to grace that says hey it's by grace you are saved and that not of yourself lest any man should boast but also if you don't have grace and God doesn't extend it to you you're going to hell so I tend to mention that part you know the good news you don't have to go there with the bad news if you really want to you're going there matter of fact you don't do something about it you'll be there so we use this as a foundation because most people don't want to talk about the other side of the coin where we want to get a full grasp of what God has done for us what God is doing to us and what God is causing to happen in us because while it is true that we have been given grace through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross as an atoning sacrifice that ever liveth Jesus himself to make atonement for us at one minute to cause us to come to oneness with God to become into unity of the fellowship of the saints in the unity of the body of believers that we would be one with God and God one with us that's what atonement means that he being a chief priest after the order of Melchizedek or Melchizedek, Melchizedek 
however you want to say it, Melch Melchizedek, that he being that type of priest can be in that place under the throne of grace extending towards us by way of interceding for us by his spirit those things with which we need in order to present ourselves before the Father as righteous. For in heaven there appears to be some type of order, structure, and design. So, because grace is an ongoing thing, it's ever active and not just an accomplished fact, it is ever working in us to accomplish the purposes of God through us to present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy that God will do when he does present us as already passed through this life, meaning that we died or we were raptured in heaven, that when he does present us, we will be faultless. But in the meantime, he wants us to give grace for grace. He wants us to extend mercy for mercy. He wants us to be forgiving for forgiveness. He wants us to be that example of grace. And so, lots of times trying to define that is like trying to define love. It gets really challenging. And so Chuck in his book is defining what grace is by trying to use some examples. And <coughs> frankly, it's kind of like, well, you know, it's kind of like trying to define love. We can define what it does. We can define how it feels. But we really can't define what it is that accurately. Not really. In using these examples... Chuck says, when Jesus was praying in the garden, he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke 22, 42. He was saying, if it is possible that men can be saved by any other means than my death, if they can be saved by being religious, by somehow gaining their own righteousness, then I don't want to go to the cross. Please don't put me through this horrible ordeal. But it was not possible. And so he went to the cross, died, and was buried, and rose again. His death made it possible for God to extend his grace to you and me. You see, sin was standing there damning up grace, so to speak, because without there being a sacrifice for sin, then the sin would block the righteousness of God from being able to extend himself because he's pure and we're impure. He's holy and we're unholy. He is righteous and we're unrighteous. There had to be some way to cross that barrier so that we would not be unrighteous, unholy, and unclean in his sight. Perhaps an illustration will make this clear. Imagine that you were charged with a crime. You were accused of trespassing on a neighbor's property. As any defense attorney knows, there are two possible ways for you to be cleared of the charge. You may seek to prove that you didn't trespass on his property, or you may seek to prove that you had every right to be there. There are other possibilities too, but we're just going with those two. Now apply this logic to our spiritual situation. God has charged us with being sinners for rebelling against his law and his will. He has charged us with unrighteousness. How can we be justified from those charges? We can't say that we are innocent, for we are guilty. All of us have sinned. Nor can we say that we had a right to do what we did because we had no such right. Our actions were clearly wrong. How then can the law be of value to us in our desire to be forgiven? The answer is, the law, in and of itself, it can't. The case is open and shut. We didn't have a right to do it. We did it anyways, and we stand guilty. We were self-determinant of our own self-destruction. <coughs> We are guilty. The Bible says it this way, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that we were conceived in sin, we were born in sin, and we would die in sin unless something is done about sin, which we say because God has shown us the way that grace has been extended to us today because of what Jesus has done. The great bank robbery. Let's change the situation and the illustration. Suppose that I robbed a bank willfully and deliberately. The law condemns me because I can't say I didn't do it or prove that I didn't do it. The video camera caught me. I can't say I had the right to do it because robbery is not included in the First Amendment. Therefore, there is no way I can be forgiven within the law. 
During the trial, I might try to say, oh, I promise I won't rob any more banks as long as I live. I will live a good, clean life from now on. I will never take anything from anybody wrongfully again. That still does not justify me from what I have already done. I might try to say I should be forgiven because I did so much good with the money. I gave some to the church and I fed my family, but my righteousness, my righteous deeds cannot counterbalance or absolve me from my guilt of my actions of actually robbing the bank. I robbed the bank. The judge may order that I pay back to the bank all the money that I took. As part of my sentence, he may order me to pick up tin cans along the freeway to help keep America beautiful, or collect aluminum cans for a nickel apiece, or a dime. I may spend the rest of my life doing good things, but still I will not be absolved of what I have done. All the works of the law cannot erase my guilt. I was guilty. My past wrongdoings still exist. I am a robber and the verdict is clear. Why is it then that in spiritual matters so many people seek to plead innocent before God by virtue of all their good works? There are many of us who respond to our guilt. There are many of us who respond to our sin, guilt, and righteous unrighteousness with regret and new resolutions. We want to make amends and turn over a new leaf, but those efforts can't win our forgiveness. Even our best efforts cannot take away the guilt of what we have already done. We can never be justified by good works. Even a whole life of good works cannot atone for a single sin. Defining grace isn't actually what's done there, but the consequences of the actions of sin is what is being presented. And so sometimes even in definitions and defining what grace is, we define why we need grace and what we try to do about grace. And that's why there's terms like cheap grace or legalistic grace or the legality of grace or the absolution of grace. Because you see, the kind of grace that God gives <coughs> absolves us from sin. It is able to be extended to us because Jesus died. But the grace that I can give is at best a poor imitation of what God has done for us. I can say, oh, I forgive you. Now you can come sit down and eat with me. And you know, I might think about forgiving and forgetting. I might think about not accounting to them the deeds that they've done against me. And I might, in some ways, live a peaceful life with that person, forgetting and forgiving and letting go those things that they've done to me. But you know, it doesn't change what the person has done, because God has recorded his life, as well as mine, in heaven. When I stand before God, I will give an accounting for my life, as well as he will. And what he has done, he will be accountable for, whether I forgive him or not. Mercy may be extended to that person by God to say, I'm sorry you feel that way and come, be forgiven and I will heal you. And God will wipe away a tear then. But unless that person has Jesus as a sacrifice for his sin, He will not be absolved or relieved from the burden of the accountability of his own life that he's lived. And if he enters into heaven imperfect, he will be cast out into the lake of fire where imperfection exists. 
Because without grace and without mercy, imperfection cannot put on perfection. The nature of God cannot come upon a person, meaning the nature of God being love, God is love, cannot come upon a person that does not have mercy and grace extended in their life, working on their life and working through their life. So the person who doesn't forgive won't be forgiven. The person who doesn't extend grace won't get grace. The person who doesn't have mercy will not receive mercy. Jesus warned us that way. And that's why grace and a proper understanding of it makes it really serious in some ways that we need to take a full understanding of just what we're doing with this thing called grace if we choose to abuse it, lose it, or in some way confuse it to such a degree that we don't extend mercy and grace to others. Because by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God. But an accountability will always be accompanying it in some way. Your forgiveness and mercy and grace will always remove the stain of sin that has come upon your life and give you robes of righteousness that are pure in God's sight. But on the day that we stand before Jesus, we need to hear him say, I know you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. For should we enter into that place where he casts us away, then we have no righteousness before God. We have no grace. And we have no mercy. It's a serious subject. It's one we take a long study on. So we fully comprehend this gift we've been given this reconciliation we are being freely offered by God for us to make with him to reconcile and to clear up the books so to speak to balance the books in the scales of God's justice and righteousness because there are people out there that want to make you work your righteousness into something so you will do something to be accepted by God when in reality you already are. But what God requires of us is love. And what God wants and desires for us to do is grace. And what God chooses to observe in us is mercy. And what God wants to work out through us is forgiveness. When you find legalism creeping into religious expression of any kind in a Christian, you don't find God there. And the Spirit of God will not always strive with man. But when you find the brokenhearted, when you find the weak and the meek, when you find those who are crying out for mercy and forgiveness, when you find those who are gentle and meek and kind and tender-hearted, when you see those that extend grace for grace and mercy for mercy, then you find not just the children of God, but the sons and daughters of God. And they will enter in.